uh, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the uh, Internet of Things. Um, I think it's the, the next big development in telecommunications. Uh, going to have massive, uh, massive changes. Uh, just before that, I would like to uh, mention to you that uh, I'm sending out every Tuesday a, um, uh, a weekly newsletter with information on it. If you're interested in that, then uh, Julie at the back can scan your uh, name and um, you get um, that uh, free newsletter. The other thing, you've seen the QR codes here. We have now a mobile site. You can download all the uh, uh, presentations free of charge as well as extra information from our site. One is the mobile site, the other one is an, an Android app. Uh, Apple is taking a little bit longer to get it in the iTunes store. That's why we haven't got uh, the, the poster for, um, for the um, iTunes yet, but it's also available um, hopefully in the next few days in, um, uh, on, um, uh, the I, uh, in iTunes. Okay, what uh, I'm going to talk about um, today is the um, Internet of Things. Um, and basically what it is, is that we are going to connect uh, devices rather than people to the, um, uh, to the Internet. And it's basically the next inflection point. Um, I don't know, perhaps there are a few people, perhaps, uh, you know, most of us, perhaps you not, this lady, but everybody else might remember that we once had this black telephone hanging on the wall in, uh, in the house, yeah? Uh, and that was what was the first wave of telecommunications. All houses or premises were connected to the telephone network. And if the telephone rang in the house, five people were running to the telephone because you wouldn't have a clue who actually was the call for. Uh, the second inflection point happened when we moved to mobile telephones. And while we have seven, eight million households in Australia, you know, now we have 25, more than 25 million mobile phones. So rather than connecting a building, you connected a person. And that was the next thing. So the te telecommunications market grew suddenly from seven uh, million to 25 million um, uh, devices or, or access points. The next thing is even much bigger. You know, in Australia alone, we talk about something like two billion devices and sensors uh, that are going to be connected to uh, the Internet of Things. Yeah, uh, you already see some of that happening, of course, in um, uh, in uh, on, on applications where you have weather information linked to road information and things like that. That sort of apps are are evolving. Uh, if you start looking at the smart grids that the utilities are putting out there, where uh, you know half of these two billion sort of devices will uh, sensors will actually be on the electricity network, and that includes, of course, all the transistors, uh, the transmitters, and things like that. But also, uh, the, all the power points in your house will have an IP address, yeah, and we'll start talking about um, uh, uh, the efficiency of the appliances uh, in in that respect. So. Um, we really start seeing this enormous uh, amount of capacity that's going to take place through the network. So lots of people, or not lots, but some people are still talking about, uh, you know, why do we need this national broadband network? Why do we need to go to fiber to the home? There's nothing to do with high-speed internet, but it is the capacity that's needed that all these billions of devices are going to be linked to the network, linked to data centers, processed in real time, analyzed in retail, and sent back on applications or on websites or whatever for us or for others to be used you know, in whatever they have to do. Yeah, that could be traffic management, weather management, energy management, or simply you, know, you having a look at the train schedules or the bus schedules or the ferry schedules and things like that. All of that, of course, will be, will be connected. And there's a very interesting uh, site I just... Um, uh, looked at uh, Blink uh, uh, Mobile uh, a little bit further in the hall where you have the mobile phone and you actually scan RF RFID codes on assets and you have the whole asset management of what's happening in um, uh, you know with your electricity poles, with your uh, bridges, with your um, sewerage devices, with your God knows whatever, you fill it in. Yeah, So you really start seeing that all of these things will have RFID codes and actually will be able to communicate and, 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 uh, and, and, and connect yeah, to databases and things like that. 
So you really start talking about billions of devices. There's nothing stopping all the groceries that are now scanned when you, when you go through the, to the cashier at, uh, at the supermarket, that they are also then provided uh, on a database that's, that's up to you. And when you get home, you immediately see what the products are that you have bought and the fridge can take track or keep track of that, etc. Yeah. Okay, these things are not happening overnight. I'm not saying this happening tomorrow, but I don't think it's too difficult to imagine what the Internet of Things is going to mean and what you actually can do with it. And once you actually start creating this sort of an environment, you get similar to what you see happening with the apps on the smartphones. There are hundreds and thousands, more than 400,000 app developers around the world. And they didn't exist four or five years ago. Yeah? So there's a whole new way, once you actually have the Internet of Things and you start uh, having communications with RFID codes and, and, and QR codes and things like that, you start imagine what sort of applications can be developed uh, along those lines. So um, broadband is essential uh, and not each individual RFID doesn't require broadband. But if you have all of that together and you actually start processing that and analyzing that, that's when you need a robust network that can handle all of that um, uh, information in real time. Um, there will be massive changes, of course, to the economy once you have these sort of uh, applications. And the result of a robust network where this is possible, and it's not just the NBN as in the fiber to the home network. Obviously, the mobile network is, is, is a critical element of that. I see the mobile network as an extension of the fiber to the home network. Yeah? There are two elements to it. You know, yes, there will, your homes will be connected to a fiber, uh, fiber connection, but at the same time, you will also be connected through your mobile phone and, and the other devices. But also you have to realize that 85% of all the time that you spend on the smartphone, as in downloading internet or doing emails and things like that, is done through Wi-Fi. You know, when it switches over in your house or in your office or in your internet cafe, that's when you actually start using uh, the Wi-Fi element of your smartphone. And the Wi-Fi element, of course, straight goes into the fixed network. It's not using the mobile network. Yeah? So it, again, it shows you how important the fixed network is with the increase of tablets and smartphones, game devices, etc. In the end, they will all be linked back to the fixed network. And you already start seeing that many households have problems when people are two or three smart, have two or three smartphones, two or three tablets, uh, the laptop, PC, and soon the smart television. Yeah? So we really start seeing the need for this robust network that's needed in order to manage this, um, uh, all these new applications that they're going to develop, and in particular in this situation around this Internet of Things. Uh, it's the sum of all of this. It's not just we don't need high-speed broadband uh, because of, uh, uh, you know, I don't have to download five movies every night. You know, still some people, and unfortunately some people in the opposition in politics are still talking about it, but that's not, of course, what broadband is all about. Yeah, broadband is not about fast downloading, downloading movies. Yeah, we don't need the national broadband network for that. But if you start talking about real economic uh, uh, applications, if you start monitoring people with heart problems uh, connected to the network, and when something gets wrong, you know, immediately information uh, gets backwards and forwards from medical staff, etc. You know, that's when you start talking about the real features and the real benefits of a robust, uh, all-encompassing network, what we in Australia call the National Broadband Network. Um, obviously, what you already start seeing, it starts changing business models and business concepts. Yeah? I mean, you all have heard uh, Harvey Norman uh, talking about, Gary, Gary uh, Harvey talking about, you know, uh, complaining about, you know, the internet and, you know, he's losing business, etc. Yeah, sorry, Harvey Norman, the digital economy started 10 years ago. You know, you didn't catch the train at that point in time. Others did and, and now are starting to overtake your business, yeah? It's not the fault of the internet and we shouldn't then refer to taxing or whatever, yeah? It's up to you to change your business. And that's the problem with a lot of companies in Australia, yeah? They, you know, and partly because of the, 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 the controversy about do we need a national broadband network of, of that. Lots of companies are lulled into, ah, and it's not going to happen. The opposition gets into power and everything will die down. I mean, guys, this is nothing to do with politics, yeah? This is going to happen anyway, yeah? 
So companies that are not changing their business models, are not taking advantage of these new developments in the digital economy, are going to be left further and further behind. Look at the music industry, look at the publishing industry, look at the retail industry now. I mean, there are plenty of examples now around that clearly shows that this is happening, yeah? Uh, and that you have to change your business. So it really requires new concepts and new business models and you really start to have start thinking outside the box. So what you need in order to get the Internet of Things going is a robust network. It has to be ubiquitous. I mean, think about the applications I'm talking about. You cannot just say only half of the electricity network in uh, areas where people can pay $150 a month for a fiber to the home connection. And that is, by the way, the price that's charged in America. Yeah? The America entry level price for fiber to the home is $150 per month. And then you only get 10, 15% penetration. Yeah? In Australia, the entry level is $25, $29 a month. Yeah? And that obviously gives you that ubiquitous opportunity yeah, to deliver that. Now, if you are a utility and you want to use the NBN for smart grids, or you are the healthcare organization and you want to monitor old age people uh, at home or disabilities or chronically ill people at home, you know, then obviously you need a ubiquitous network. Yeah? Everybody needs to be connected, not just a happy few, few who can afford to it. So that's why ubiquitous to build business cases you know, for these applications that I just mentioned you know, are essential. If only 5, 10 or 15% of the population are using it, there's no business model for it. Yeah? Or, or only a very limited niche market business model. We are talking about changing mass market business models. Um, security, you know, think about the fact that if you are a heart patient and you are monitored with an, an Internet of Thing device, uh, you don't want to be on a crappy internet connection, you know. You want a robust network that makes sure that your health is monitored properly, yeah. So, you know, the, the, the robustness of the network, the security of the network, the privacy of the network is as important. And unfortunately, these sort of elements are not discussed when politicians make uh, announcements like we don't need a national broadband net for downloading, uh, you know, movies tonight, yeah. That is not the issue, you know, that's false information, yeah. The real information is that we need a national broadband net for our economy, for our social services, and this Internet of Things is a critical element, critical infrastructure to all of that. Um, so you need the capacity for high volumes. I estimate there will literally be thousands of data centers around the country. Each region, each town will have its own data center, you know, where things are going to be processed, data collected, analyzed, and, and provided. And obviously, all interconnected with each other. Uh, uh, you know, if you think about Google and Facebook and Microsoft, these companies together have something like five million servers around the world. Yeah, so this is a, this is immense. Yeah, this is not just you know a big data center in Sydney will do the job. Yeah, this is huge. All these data centers will need high capacity. Yeah, otherwise they can't function. Yeah, they need you know you now already start seeing that businesses are positioning themselves next to where the the, the points of inter interconnect are going to be set up for. Um, uh, for, the, for the national broadband network. Companies understand that. If you go to Google, if you go to Intel, if you go to those companies who rely on the digital economy, you know, their reason why they, put, they choose locations is based on having access to um, uh, broadband as well, of course, as to electricity. Yeah? So you really start seeing that companies who understand what this is all about are positioning themselves in that area and understand you need that high level of um, capacity in the network. Um, so you will see that a lot of these devices that you uh, see here are all being going to be connected. I mentioned the RFD text, the QR code text, uh, and you know, I mean, I don't, I don't have to say, I have to, to, to explain to you that once you have these codes, you know, on the, on the cards and on the products, yeah, that businesses will come up with interesting applications, yeah. Look at the app stores, you know, and you automatically see that once an infrastructure is there, be it smartphones, be it uh, 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 near-field communication, be it RFIDs, these are going to be critical elements and businesses will pick it up and start running with it and come up with very interesting applications around it. Um, if you also start looking at uh, situations like um, environment monitoring, you know, we have to have a more sustainable environment. Obviously, 
you know, you can monitor that through the, um, uh, uh, with, the, with devices like this. You can link that to traffic information. You can link that to uh, activities that are happening, uh, event management and things like that. You know what, one of the applications that I saw as, as well is that, you know, you have your, um, you go to an event and, and you get a an, uh, ticket or you get an, an, an arm ticket or whatever that have an RFID tag that could have a QR code tag and that immediately would actually give the person access to information about the event but also for example could store emergency information you know if something happens what's your nearest contact what's the nearest uh, po point that you have to do I'm talking to the um, uh, to the uh, Australian communication exchange which are looking after the hearing impaired same stories these people can have arm tags or tags or, 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 or something with them that people can use with a smartphone to actually start talking to these people who are deaf, yeah? Uh, just like that. Now imagine the sort of applications that are happening for every single um, uh, person in our society there will be benefits, yeah, in the Internet of Things. Obviously, as you will see in the next slide, security is absolutely paramount. You know, that's one of the things that I'm really worried about, that if you look at the Googles and the Facebooks, uh, etc. You know, they are not they're not careful enough in my eyes with security about privacy. I need to see, I actually want to see a situation where every information that's used on me is my property. You know, it doesn't really matter if it's my shopping, if it's my personal, if it's my business, if it's my medical, all of these things I'm more than happy to make them available, yeah, if I see there is a benefit in it, but I have to be in charge. I don't want to be somebody else collecting all sorts of information and using that without my permission. I call this permission-based marketing. Permission-based marketing is fine, but you know, you need to have my permission. And I've, I'm talking to Google and people like Vin Serve at Google and I'm talking about them that you, these organizations, will have to make sure that that security exists because otherwise you get big brother coming in, governments or international organizations we're actually starting to cram down on security issues and, uh, and privacy issues. And then obviously you could actually start to see a severe hampering of the opportunities and possibilities that are available in, um, uh, with these new Internet of Things, broadband, smart grids, uh, uh, developments, etc. Yeah, and countries like Russia and China you know, have different sort of rules about privacy, etc. If they get the upper hand in international developments, you know, then we could see a severe limitation of the possibilities that are happening. So that's why I want to see the industry taking the lead there and making sure that we don't need this heavy-handed sort of regulations to protect privacy and to protect security in that area. Um, as I mentioned, security is paramount. Uh, in all of these, um, uh, in all of these sort of areas, I can't stress that uh, enough. And particularly, you know, because I'm I'm involved in the international discussions, and I know that companies such as Russia and China are putting an enormous amount of uh, uh, lobbying towards the United Nations to actually to step in and start reducing the possibilities of the internet. And that, of course, would be uh, against uh, what the internet is all about. It is an open system, and we don't want to see it a closed system that is totally uh, regulated by, by governments. Yeah? So we're not just creating new companies, we are creating new industries. You know, uh, for every job that is lost because of technology is coming into the organization, for every job that is lost, 10 new jobs are created. Yeah? But not necessarily in that company. You know, if you have a, a car manufacturing company and you can't comp compete anymore, and you lose 400 jobs, then obviously those 400 people will not be employed, cannot be employed straight into that area. But another 400 people, or actually another 4,000 people, and particularly young people who are coming into the industry and who are computer literate and understand these, will find new jobs and, and start new jobs for themselves. You know, they, they create new jobs around the applications that I was talking about around the Internet of Things and things like that. So, you know, there is real, uh, real new opportunities in this particular area. I mean, we all saw the headlines in Australia on the newspaper about the, 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 the car manufacturers closed down 
in Victoria and all, my God, doom and gloom and shocking and Australia is going to collapse. At the same time, the unemployment in Australia went down 0.1%. Yeah? So, you know, already, yeah, with all of these high line and, 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 and media beat up sort of um, uh, disaster stories, at the same time, Australia, you know, is creating still more jobs than, than that, that we are losing. Yeah? So, I think we, um, we also have to look through some of these media and political sort of messages that are sent out to us. So we have to have uh, visionary organizations to understand the shift, you know, as again, I'm using uh, some of the retailers as an example of the music industry, the publishers, you know, who are too late. We need vision. We need people that understand the future. We need people that understand that you have to cannibalize some of the old economy in order to move forwards in the new economy. That's tough. That's difficult. It's not easy, yeah? It's easy to say, I close my eyes, nothing is happening, I print my newspaper and everybody for the next 100 years will still buy my newspaper. That's easy to think, but it's not happening in reality. Same with the music industry and, you know, the, the empty stores that you now see in the city while people shop online, you know? That is reality, yeah? If you, if you think that you can stop the world, you can stop the tsunami, yeah? Then, unfortunately, as Harvey Norman did, does find out, you know, that's not going to happen, yeah? One of the things that I, I want to mention, and I was flabbergasted, I went shopping the other day in Woolworths in Lane Cove, here in Sydney, and it's underground, yeah? And they have big sort of advertisement, even on the floor, about, you know, mobile shopping, and our things are now online, and things like that. So I thought, you know, let's grab my, my smartphone, and let's, let's see, yeah? First of all, there's no mobile signal, they have no Wi-Fi, yeah? There is no way in the world that I can communicate yeah, with, that, with that company. And you, you can imagine what you, you know, if I'm in Woolworths, you know, and I say, what's your specials? And they can say, go to aisle five, you know, second from the left and things like that. Where are they? Where are those retailers, you know? Why aren't they doing that? They have the RFI, RFID codes already on their products, yeah? It's already at the cashier, yeah? But they don't really communicate with us. As I mentioned, Woolworths should start talking to me when I'm at home, not in the shop. You know, they could start helping me preparing the shopping list, telling me about the deals. Where are those companies? Where are those? Why aren't they doing that? And then five years later, they complain that, you know, this is happening. They now, people are now shopping in Korea or in China and getting their groceries delivered by plane or God knows whatever, yeah? And they complain about, you know, that, uh, that this is happening, yeah? So it really is this change in attitude this change in business modeling that companies will, uh, will, have to, uh, will have to look at. So thank you very much.